Okay, I'm going to take you all the way back to 1990. Uh, when I first arrived at MIT, uh, I was a housemaster at East Campus, and for those of you that know MIT, you realize that that is a very peculiar way to be introduced. And as part of that, Chuck Vest, the president, kept coming by. And Chuck had a message for the undergraduates in addition to trying to live cleaner lives than they were living. Uh, but the message that he was conveying was that those that create technologies have a duty to encourage responsible use of the technologies, to encourage responsible development of the technologies. So I'm sitting there in bizarre old East Campus House wondering how the heck do you act on that? Then we turn to political science. Turn to political science in terms of providing research methods or approaches that might inform just a bit ways of encouraging responsibility at the level of individuals or institutions like MIT or even in terms of public policy. So I'm going to tell a story in three acts. Act one was while I was director of the center, we created something called the Program on Emerging Technologies. We had NSF support. The we in this case was political science, along with Rose Smith from STS and the History of Technology, David Newman and Dan Hastings from Engineering Systems, and Larry McRae, a graduate of this department. What we tried to do initially, as a check on our own hubris, was to look back at early examples of emerging technologies and see how were benefits and risks managed. What predictions were made? How did it work out? And this was a check on hubris, all right, because we discovered that every prediction ever made on emerging technologies was wrong. This also underscored the need for approaches to managing technologies responsibly that emphasized very seriously proactive engagement with risks based on your best estimates, your priors, but continual updating and revising, gathering information and feeding back to improve the quality of the policies. And we had, had very nice retrospective studies to inform it. We had prospective applications. And the bottom line was you better be moving towards adaptation and correction because you're going to get it wrong. So then we decided to behave like political scientists. Of course, you have to do a cross-sectional study of US regulations that require adaptation. And we discover, sadly enough, that although it is obvious that under conditions of complexity and uncertainty, one should be gathering information, adapting, and learning, in practice it just didn't happen even when required. It would happen maybe 10% of the time. And we tried to examine cross-sectionally why it was that it was hard, came up with some theories, of course, we're good political scientists, but discovered that we couldn't really validate the theories to any extent without doing deeper casework. So we did some deep cases. We went through a number of areas, some good, some bad, National Transportation Safety Board, but also turning to NASA and the disasters of the space shuttle, PM 2.5, good story, dietary standards on trans fats, bad, to get an understanding of looking within the process, what factors proved to be important, what institutional designs seemed to work better and worse. And as we looked at that, we came up with some ideas, but we couldn't really tell if they were right or wrong. But we had some hunches, and there were a little bit more than hunches, to tell you the truth. So then we enter what one might term an experimental phase. Now, I don't want to use the word experimental in a sense that would get me in trouble with the Committee on Use of Humans as Experimental Subjects. What I mean is pushing for adjustments or changes in policy that are premised on design principles that emerge from the retrospective work and seeing who pushes back, seeing what works or doesn't work. And this requires a little luck to be able to actually engage in this kind of policy experimentation. I'm going to only go with two areas, pharmaceuticals and synthetic biology. So in the area of pharmaceuticals, I've been partnering with the Center for Biomedical Innovation at MIT, and we've been working on promoting adaptive licensing very much along the lines of those general principles that I raised earlier. And the partners in this work have included really good people at MIT, but also regulators. I've done four pieces in clinical pharmacology and therapeutics, two as first author, two as second author. And the co-authors were typically people like the senior medical officer of the European Medicines Agency or the deputy commissioner of the FDA or people working for pharmaceutical companies. 
The proposals that we were making were in part pushing for adaptive risk management, meaning oftentimes acting a little bit quicker in granting a conditional approval, but at the same time trying to limit risk by restricting initial access to those that benefit the most. Not because you know there's a problem, but because you know there's significant uncertainty. And then promoting aggressively gathering information to update and revise from observations of the drug in use. So it's not a standing target, it's management of uncertainty over the life cycle. Political science comes in. What would you expect to see under these conditions? You would expect to see a resistance on the part of companies to actually gathering the information that could limit or restrict access to a drug. Conversely, you'd expect to see support for expansion of treatment groups. You'd expect to see collective goods problems in terms of gathering information and providing information access. And all the things that we think of as political scientists doing political economy proved to be significant in terms of who is supporting and who is opposing these reforms. At the end of the day, a miracle happened. The European Union, the European Medicines Agency, is conducting adaptive licensing pilots right now with drugs, including one developed by a local firm, Bluebird Pharmaceuticals. And they're doing so in order to learn from experience about what works or does not work in practice. Why did that happen? In part because you're lucky if you end up with a senior medical officer of the EMA as your co-author. But at the same time, we observe some support from Canada, more resistance. I was part of the PCAS Committee on, on Pharmaceuticals Innovation uh, within the US. And again, it's a way of learning about the politics by pushing for reform, but monitoring and observing what the reactions are. In the realm of synthetic biology, I've been part of the National Science Foundation Synthetic Biology Engineering Research Center and the Synthetic Biology Center here at MIT. This is, let's call it advanced biological engineering. And it's provided an opportunity to again be trying to act on the principles of adaptive risk management, but for real, on a micro level. There's this competition called iGEM with 3,000 plus crazy undergraduates from all over the world competing with a registry of 2,000 biological parts, unscreened. So one experiment, if you will, was seeking to get a large firm to provide screening services for free. And you want to talk about public goods provision from the perspective of companies. Screwing it up on safety and security could be a threat to all. To have one company stepping forward and doing the screening, it was Craig Vanner's company, SGI DNA, took a little bit of doing but it also was a bit of a test of our theories on K groups and the minimum number of firms that need to be involved. Maybe it was a theory of hegemonic stability being tested because they're a pretty important company. Other examples, technologists have been stepping forward with examples of work that they're doing that pose environmental or security or health benefits and risks. And we've been working very closely with those companies to try to identify academics and companies to identify the potential problems. But here again, the politics come in. Also trying to generate support for research activities to better understand the risk to inform public policy. And that takes you a little bit away from the particularistic and narrow interests towards more broader interests. And you need the support of public authority to do it. And that experiment has worked a little bit better than I expected. The breakthrough moment on that was an exercise on algal biofuels production where we agreed on what we needed to know more about. A gentleman representing one of the largest biotech companies said it would be a really good idea for us to have better understanding, but it has to be publicly funded because no one believes the research that we do. The environmental NGO said, we agree with you completely. We do not believe the research that you fund. The scientists said, we firmly support public funding for our research. And then a miracle happened. NSF said, we'll write a check. Again, pushing back, getting a sense through action as part of research is the theme that I wish to lay out. In closing, an acknowledgment of debt. On methods and scope, on methods, Steve Van Evera, focusing on ideas and substantive knowledge. Hayward Alker, with his department at the time, 
focusing on debates over information as a key part of political influence. And in terms of scope, Gene Skolnikoff saying, you know, we're sitting at MIT. There is another part of the institute that we should be aware of. And Nazli Shukri, who will be speaking next, talking about the richness of this institution for what it has beyond political science, but in interaction with political science. Thank you. <laughs>